All right, here we are with the Adam Starkweather Vietnam Rumor of War. Adam Starkweather, you might also know from Where Eagles Dare, Grand Tactical Series. And this is one of those love them or hate them games. It tends to get a lot of hate. Uh, but I've owned it twice now, so I've got to give it a try. The combat is weird. Um, so we're going to go through this. I'm going to let you know, you know, what do you think? A lot of negative press on uh, Board Game Geek. Not that, um, you know, I follow that site with fervor, but uh, it ain't good in the comments. So... This is a chit pull game, and the combat is, it is chit pull heavy, it is die roll mod heavy, it is strange, but somehow I'm drawn to it. There's a lot of Vietnam type factors in here, riverine boats, air power, helicopter transport, hidden units, VC, NVA, Laos, all sorts of crazy stuff, tunnels. Uh, so what I want to do is go over this game and some of the basic uh, mechanics. The first one will be movement and combat. Uh, I have a little situation here that I set up just outside of Dalat. We have a Vietnamese, uh, Viet Cong regiment and it's going to be cut off by elements of the 1st Infantry Division in Vietnam, the U.S. 2nd, U.S. 26th. Um, and we have a headquarters unit way back here in this town. And then Kamran is our capitalist supply source. And I'm going to show you how to activate, do a movement, and we're going to try a combat here. It's going to be weird. Uh, so just buckle up and get ready. This is the... Second Corps Military District. As you remember, they divided uh, they divided Vietnam into these military districts. Um, this is a road and national route, and we're in rough terrain up here. So Dalat, we're going to be heading off a VC unit that's active in the area. So let's see how this is done. I think I've got this set up right. I'm not going to be doing a full turn because we still have to do uh, air power and all that stuff. Um, there's a pretty cool air power system in this. Covers a lot of stuff, um, but I'm not gonna focus on that. I just wanna show people how combat works because then you can instantly decide, oh yeah, that game's weird, or no, that's cool, so. All right, so I'm gonna go over some basic stuff here. The example of play in the scenario book is huge, by the way. Um, there's a lot in it. Uh, but the example of play only covers like one type of situation. So you're going to end up scratching your head. And I had to go, uh, I had to get answers from Starkweather about certain things. Um, mainly the support rules. What you see over here, we have a support level that's set for the scenario. And I just kind of made these up for this example I'm doing. And then we have the communist support levels. And there's a massive die roll, combat modifier die roll chart on the map here. So, and you can see over here the chit draw system that we'll be using revolves around these chits. So, we're going to find out here um, how this works. And I'm going to try through this. This will be a dry run, my first one. So, if I screw this up, I don't even know if anyone will notice because I don't think there's any videos of this game on YouTube. So, all right, let's give this a shot here. Um, get these moved over, our little die roll things. These will be come in handy. The first thing we're going to do is we're just going to go straight to... There's a long sequence of play here. We're going to be in the activation phase, and we're just going to go right to the capitalist player turn. Um, so we're like on step three of a sequence of play. It's huge. It's like strategic, turn, and then end. And there's a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff in there. So... This game is, um, it's in depth, but it's just kind of, uh, the rule book's all over the place and I've had to massacre this rule book. Um, like things that should be in the front or near the back. Uh, so I've had to mark the shit out of this rule book. Um, but we're going to give it a shot here. As my Vietnam, end of the month Vietnam splurge continues, 
Then we'll get back to World War II, but I've done a lot of World War II, so. All right, let's take a look at how this works. So the capitalist player, uh, you flip all communist units to their fresh sides, not the HQs, which is weird, it's on the capitalist turn. All right, now we do activations, okay. So activations in this game, you're gonna need an HQ, okay? And you wanna find a fresh HQ, such as this one. If it has been activated already, it will be on its spent side. You need a fresh HQ, and that HQ must be within 10 movement points of four fresh units that they want to activate. So uh, if you look at the movement chart here, I think I've done this right. Uh, roads are one half for the capitalists here and one for the communists. So <clears throat> the HQ has to trace what they call an LOC. Now this is the one I had to look up because it was like hidden. It's a line of communication. So a unit has a line of communication that can trace a supply source or trace to an HQ that can trace the supply source. So I put him here on purpose. He's gonna trace to this. Then anything he can, he can activate, he'll go to spent. You can activate four units within 10 movement points. So one, one half two, one half three, one half four, or you can just go one, or you know, one, two, and then you know, like this, split like that. Um, even if it's rough, it's two points. So de they're definitely within ten. I kind of staged it that way. And he has a supply source, so they have a line of communication. He's gonna he's gonna flip and activate these two units. Every unit um, in this game, it's a little bit strange. Okay, they have five movement points. Okay, so there's a base movement point of five. To initiate combat, you have to spend movement points as well as moving next to someone. And there is a ton of different combat types. And I'm not familiar with all of them. But I've already decided I'm going to do a prepared attack. And that's three movement points. Okay. So just that's just that's why you don't see any stats on these counters. And you're probably like, well, how do you know what you know what their attack and defense and all that is? That all comes into a die roll and the type of support that you spend. And also, uh, there is a unit size difference modifier. You know, if one unit's bigger than the other one or one's smaller, there is a there is a modifier on that. Now you can you can activate up to four units, and that can change. There's theater commanders uh, in the game, so. Uh, that might change the amount of units that you can activate. I haven't gotten deep enough now to look at theater commanders yet. Um, but for example, if, let me see if I can find one real quick here. Theater commanders. It kind of goes right into lines of communication. Um, not seeing it right off the bat here. I know there's something about the U.S. elections. Theater commanders, leaders. Um, during every victory point check with Westmoreland, increase the U.S. unrest by one. Uh, do, 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 do. Oh, there's nothing there. How about Abrams? Nothing there. Weyand. Uh, okay, nothing there. Right off the bat, I'm not seeing where they influenced that, but I might be missing something anyway. But anyway, the line of communications is required for many game functions, including activating an HQ, uh, removing a US battalion, and getting any support in a combat to either a cadre or an HQ. Um, and each side does do that differently now. If the Americans or South Vietnamese ever have to trace a line of communication and there's an enemy Zoc um, blocking it, like say like right there, uh, you're going to draw a chit from the snafu cup, which is like they call it the cup of snafu. 
and that's where something bad happens. It's like a random event where something bad happens. Uh, so if a unit is tracing a line of communication in any hex, right, along the trace point or the road that leads to the supply source passes through any hex in enemy control, right, like say you completely surround Comron or something like that, um, you're going to draw from the cup of snafu for the tracing unit. This applies only once by the capitalist, regardless of the number of enemy controlled hexes. If the capitalist choose not to trace the Atlantic communications, whatever game function you are trying to do is not performed. So that's just a little thing to have a heads up on right there. All right. Just wanted to explain the line of communication. It gets weird later in the game. There's a lot of trouble with it uh, with on the rules forms and things like that. So we'll have to explain that a little bit later. Okay. So you want to activate, you spend your HQ, you flip them over, and uh, one after another, each active unit may move up to five movement points as its initial movement. Terrain costs are listed on the terrain effects chart. All right, so we're gonna move here, and it is plus one to go into an enemy Zoc, plus that's rough. So rough is two, so we're down to three. Add one, okay, we're down to two. Uh, oh, I can't do the attack I wanted to do. Okay, we're gonna do a hasty attack. We're gonna declare a hasty attack. So you're gonna, there's tons of these markers, right? Um, you're gonna draw a random marker and there's a hasty attack, meeting engagement. You're gonna be drawing one of these. And there's two, two whole stacks, you gotta put them in a cup and all this fun stuff. <clears throat> okay. So let me just check real quick here on how this works with multiple combat hexes. But that's gonna burn up all of the uh, 26 regiments movement points. Okay, one type of support in this game is adjacency support. So what you can do is, I just want the US 2nd Regiment here to move adjacent, and we're not gonna declare combat. So we're gonna be doing a hasty attack, which probably isn't the best. This is not what I drew, I'm just putting that on there so you know. Um, I think there, is there a combat chip? I may have forgot to punch out the combat chip, my bad. Uh, I I think there was something that I didn't get. I didn't see one, but what I like to do is this. All right. Yeah, I got a bad glare coming in here. All right, sorry, I had to adjust my lighting. Okay, so this isn't what I drew. This is going to, this is just an example. You would put, you would draw and put this on top. So I'm just gonna move this one in. Okay, he's just gonna move in, and that would normally be, uh, two movement points that so he'd be down the three, but he's gonna <clears throat> provide support. The attack's gonna come from this unit here on that hex. Okay, now, um, the combat rules are pretty simple, okay? Um, after all active units have moved, and let me move this down just a little bit. I'm gonna move this this way. <clears throat> just to make sure everyone can still hear me. Um, after all the active units have moved and declared combats, the non-phasing player can perform reserve movement. We're not gonna do that. Um, we're not gonna perform reserve movement. We're gonna keep this as simple as possible. Um, then the active units that are not in enemy ZOC may perform an early exploitation movement. We don't have any of that. <clears throat> I'm sorry, it would have been three to move in here, two for the rough and one for the Zoc. Actually, I'm sorry again. Um, oh, you can only cancel an enemy Zoc if you're in the hex, I think. Let's see here. Uh, friendly units negate enemy Zox in the hex they occupy for all game rules. Okay. Yes, yeah, so there's no friendly units negate enemy Zox. Okay. Okay. So we declared our combat, right? We're going to be attacking this hex. He's going to move in to provide adjacency support. The attack's going to come from the 26th Regiment. Now, combat is interesting. Uh, the combat chits should be placed in two mugs. You group meeting engagement and hasty attack chits into one mug, and then you group prepared attack and deliberate attack chits into another group, or into another mug. So you're gonna have two piles as shown here. That's gonna go in a mug, and that's gonna go in a mug. We're gonna be drawing from the hasty attack mug, that one. So we're gonna put all those in there, and we're gonna get some bizarro results here that you've probably never seen in a war game before. It's very strange. Um, 
So you'll draw a chit from the appropriate cup. You place it on the hex, which I should have done already, but I'm going to wait and show you guys. So we'll place it on the hex. And you're, to resolve it, both players determine their support levels. You add up the modifiers. You roll a die. It'll be a D10 or a D6. Okay, and that's going to be on the chit that we draw, right? And the support modifiers that are available to each side depend on the support level from this track here. Okay, so we're going to be using those numbers. They're going to come in in a minute. And you're going to roll a die, and the spread between those two die rolls indicates how much damage is done or who wins the combat. So the die roll modifiers are going to get super crazy when we do this combat. All right, let me prepare my mug. Okay, got the mug prepared. All right, the mug is prepared. Prepared. The mug is prepared. We're going to just put all those in there. We're going to shake them up. Just ignore that old paint. Don't worry about it. The game's not getting harmed. People are freaking out right about now. It's all good. We're right outside of the lot. We've got some combat going on. The 26th U.S. Infantry Regiment of the 1st Infantry Division is making a move on a VC regiment spotted moving toward the lot here. And we've got a spent HQ back here that can trace supply to Kamran. Supply to Kamran. And we're going to go here, and we're going to draw. Now, as soon as I move up and make the attack, I should have put a chit on here. But for the sake of teaching this, I didn't do it yet. So we're going to pull. We're, I only had two movement points. We're going to do a hasty attack. And we'll see if that bites us. Here's the different attacks you can do and how much they cost. All right. There you go. Meeting engagement's a little bit different. Um, that takes place almost immediately, so... All right, hasty attack. Let's see what we got here. Let's see what we pull. You could get a random event, all sorts of strange things going on in this game. I got, it's not a meeting engagement. We're gonna flip it over to hasty attack. I'm gonna put that down. Ah, I lost my tweezers. All right, random event is no. So there's no random event. Advanced three. Uh, my support is C, which is not good. That means the support, like artillery and air, there's a delay in the support that I want. And we'll be using a D6 and no random event. Okay, so I'm going to move that right about there because we're going to have to read that chit to determine what's going on here. Okay, so this is the die rolled in the modifier. RE, yes or no. Is there a random event? Okay, the support level C, not the, not the best. Um... Support level C means that we're going to, that's like the amount of the attack planning time that we have, and we'll be subtracting the support that we have available. There's going to be a penalty to, to what we have, to what we can use, okay? Um, and then the advance on the chit, uh, that is the number of exploitation movement points the attacker can spend after he has advanced into the combat hex if we're able to force a retreat here on this VC regiment. So three is the number on that. All right. So I'm going to try to explain this. It's weird. All right. To resolve the combat, both players are going to determine support at the modifiers and roll a die, either D10 or D6, depending on the situation. And then we're going to get that spread like that, the, the winner of the combat is going to be the player with the highest, the higher modified die roll. The spread between the two die rolls is what determines how bad things are. Okay. Let's go through this uh, step by step. This is going to be wacky. All right. We're going to have to keep track of our die roll mods. We are definitely going to have. Now, you can use these chits here to mark it on the map. I'm just going to use a piece of paper. Um, it's just easier for me that way. Plus, I don't want to knock the chits and accidentally screw something up. Um, I will need, however, a D6. I'll grab that in a momento. All right. Now, a few general rules here. Each activated unit may place only one combat chit per game turn. Once a combat is declared, it must occur. The attacker may not cancel the attack. A defending hex may be attacked multiple times, but not more than one combat chit may occupy a single hex at a time. 
Uh, so later you could, I could have moved him in and done another chit, but I'm gonna, I moved him in to get adjacency support modifier. Uh, not sure how that's gonna work, but we'll see. Okay. Once we resolve this combat, this chit's gonna go back to the cup, okay? And some people may be familiar with the North Korea OSS uh, game from Compass Games. I'm not sure. I think that was a mess, according to some people. Uh, so we'll see. We'll see how this fares. But I don't. I don't think these systems are getting a lot of love. But you know, we'll give it a shot and see what happens. All right, meeting engagements a little bit different. Okay, so let's determine the tank support artillery and air modifiers. You start with the support level number on the track. So I have made up this um, here. The US player has five artillery support points, that air and that tank. I gave them a lot. Uh, the communist player, not so good because they're VC. I gave the VC one artillery support. This is NVA, we won't be looking at the red. Um, so I didn't give them very good, but I gave the US a lot of support. And the yellow is uh, South Vietnam, okay? So we start with those basic levels and we're gonna be subtracting how many we have available. You don't modify your overall total. This is just to see what you have available for this battle. We got a C, so our attack planning time is going to subtract uh, how many tank support we have by one. Artillery is gonna go down two and air down one. So in theory, <clears throat> We only really have three artillery support points to spend. Um, air went down one, so we only have technically three to spend. Tank went down one, we only have two to spend. But you don't actually adjust those levels. Just remember that. That is the thing I had a lot of trouble wrapping my head around. I had to go to the game designer to say, hey, do these levels go up or down? What makes them go up or down? And it turns out retreating in combat is the only thing that will devastate your total. So <clears throat> that C on here is what we'll be using. That represents like, oh, it's a hasty attack. You know, we didn't have enough time to prepare, so our support's lower. <clears throat> okay. Um, any attacking unit, fresh or spent, active or inactive, adjacent to a combat hex may support the combat. The attacker gets one support modifier for the first unit adjacent. So we're gonna get one right there. I'm just gonna mark down plus one for um, <clears throat> adjacent unit, okay? Now, <coughs> there, um, the amount of support to be subtracted is given for the attacker by a letter on the combat chit. For the defender, by the type of combat. So the defender is gonna get a certain amount of support based on the combat type and you see Hasty attack. Okay. All right, so here's what we do. We want to figure out what we want to throw into this. So you have to be careful because if I'm forced to retreat, I could lose some of the points that I dumped into this. And your support levels will actually go down if you have to retreat. So I'm going to use, uh, let's take a look here. There's some rules. To allow artillery and tank support, the combat hex must trace a load back to a friendly HQ or cadre or a fire base. The combat hex. All right, so I'm thinking that artillery and tank support are gonna be allowed because they can get back to the HQ, which is just off the camera here. All right, I'll bring that back a little. Man, those bugs are so loud. I know in the last few recordings at night, they've been going off out there. It sounds like I'm on a porch, but I'm not. That's actually coming through the wall in the window. All right, um, okay. If a US unit has no division base in play, the unit is independent or is a cadre, they may draw support from an HQ or fire base. Both attacker and defender use the terrain in the combat hex to determine any sort of support modifiers. If there is a road or city town hex connecting the declared attackers and the combat hex, the attacking player may pay one level of tank support at the end of combat to negate that tank support effect. All right. So basically they're saying you can use the roads um, to do that, but I'm not, I don't think I have that bonus here. If there is a road or city town hex connecting the declared attackers in the combat hex. No. 
So I would have had to attack him like here. <clears throat> all right, players do not have to use all of their allowed support and may choose not to since any support used may sustain losses in combat, C5.6. And that is what threw me off before. I could not for the life of me figure out where that was in the book, but it's actually under retreats. All right. <clears throat> okay. Here's what we get. Um, the amount of support to be subtracted is given for the attacker by a letter and for the defender by the type of combat. All right. So if I'm looking at this deliberate attack... Uh, or this hasty attack, it looks like 333 for the defender. All right, so the US player is going to do, I'm not gonna use air support, let's do artillery. Let's just do artillery to keep this simple. So in order to, remember, like I said, in order to use artillery, the combat hex must trace a loc back to a friendly HQ or to a fire base, which I can do. So I'm gonna put, now my artillery was is normally five, but due to that pre preparation at C, I'm down two. So I have three points of artillery that I can put in there. I'm gonna put all three that I can spend in there to have a plus four to my die roll so far. Uh, let's see, um, normally, you know, I could supply air support, but air support, you have to plan ahead of time at the beginning of the turn. And I haven't really gone over that yet. So um, I kinda wanna show how that's done later. But basically you commit points to support for ground support. And that's that's kind of like where you would see this right there. So we're just gonna say this is uh you know this is so hasty that they don't even have they haven't even called air support in. Alright, um now here's the thing. You have to look at the at the terrain effects chart. So rough terrain is two for one. So what that means is, if you look up there, it's two for one. So that means the terrain is bad. So for every two points of support, I only get one die roll modifier. Now I put in three artillery. Let's just make that two because you know you got you got to round down. I think it is. Uh, let's just let me check that real quick. Oh, I forgot where they said uh, if they round down or not. I don't have to find that. Let's just make it a nice, easy number. I can't remember. Shoot. See, this is where my memory fails me. Uh, but you're going to modify that by the terrain defense. i got to find that rule. All right, so let's say I'm going to put two points of artillery support in. Well, that rough terrain is two for one, so I only get one die roll modifier. So we, we have plus one adjacent. That's plus one. I use two artillery support, and due to the rough, it's two for one. So I only get plus one die roll modifier. So right now I'm only at plus two to the die roll. Okay, and I'm using a D6. And that's not that great so far. Uh, what else can I do? Bombardment support is available only to the capitalist player, the Americans. Uh, that's like artillery. The bombardment planning value is always two. Uh, if you're within the, um, two hexes from a coast, Right, if I was within, like, if I was here or something, you could get the United States Seventh Fleet to bombard the hex for support. Um, there's no size difference. Uh, often, the, the American player will either choose or force to be used restricted combat, um, and that's where you know you have to, you know, you can't shoot or engage without uh, commander's permission and stuff like that. Okay. Now let's look at the defender. The defender is going to have minus three to all of his support totals. So the VC player only has one artillery support. He's not going to get to throw any support. So I don't think he's going to get any die roll modifiers if I'm looking at this right. I should point out too that I should have, since these guys activate, I should have put them on their spent side like this. Okay, so they should be spent technically, um, but I just want to keep them. Well, I'll I'll be I'll do it by the rules and flip them over because they're spent. 
Um, if you're wondering about that rule, that's on 4.5. Each HQ or unit that is activated flips immediately to its spent side, although the unit is not considered spent until the end of the activation. This is to mark the currently active units, okay? So that way you don't lose track. So I'll, I will flip them over there. All right, so right now I'm looking at plus two to my die roll for the Defender. Uh, the Defender uh, die roll modifiers, terrain, artillery, tank, bombardment, nothing. Unit adjacent to the VC, no. There's no size advantage, disadvantage. Um, so it's looking kind of grim here. Now, the VC is in rough. So you want to make sure that you look on the terrain effects chart. Rough plus three, addition to the defense roll, plus three for the VC because they're dug in into some rough terrain. So the VC has plus three DRM for free and the US only has two. There is a chance I may not, uh, I may not do too well in this combat. We're gonna see what happens. All right, so I think we've got all that taken care of. So bear with me here. There's a lot of dice modifiers. Um, let me just make sure there's no random events. So I think now we need to just roll the dice. Now, so if you wanted to use the board, um, the chart, it's going to get dark here in a second. Hold on. You would have done, uh, right here, you would have done three for the communist player and two for the capitalist. And then there's a, if it gets really big, it goes to 30. Oh, can you see that? There we go. So if you wanted to use that chart, this is kind of what it would look like. You just put your die roll chits on there. All right, so we're gonna roll the die and see what we get here. I'm gonna take two sixes. I'm gonna try to get a red one and a blue one. Okay, this is where it gets weird. All right, now, you know I'm gonna roll a D6 because that's what's on my combat chit. The defender can choose to roll a D10 or a D6. Now, if he chooses to roll a D10, he becomes spent and he'll have to flip over, which means he won't be able to, you know, kind of react and do things on the on the on the communist player turn. If you choose to do a D6, you can stay not spent, but of course, you know, you may not beat your opponent's die roll. Um, so I've always found that interesting. I could roll a D10 right now and probably easily defend this combat. So this is live, right? And uh, apparently, this was not a good way to attack. So I probably should have used more support, but you know, you're kind of learning with me as I go and uh, wedging these VC out of there. Uh, it's not working too well for me. Uh, okay, so I'll be rolling a D6 and so will the Viet Cong because they don't wanna flip, you know, if they, something might happen, they might be able to do something quickly. Um, the red will be communist, uh, blue capitalist, of course. And then let's see what happens. Oh yeah, and I did find uh, on page 12, um, the five point 3.1, uh, you do, when you apply the terrain effect, you round down. So just a heads up on that. So I would have lost that point anyway. Okay, on the support thing. All right, we're gonna roll our dice. All right, so the uh, United States has gotten a six plus two is eight. The VC has gotten four plus three is seven. There is a one point spread in favor of the US. Okay, now, an uh, interesting thing about these die rolls in this game, there's a lot of weird stuff. If I had rolled um, a one unmodified, uh, I would have placed a poor or penal unit marker as appropriate on any fighting unit. Um, so like the unit instantly becomes tired and becomes a poor unit or in the case of the communist, a penal unit. Um, now, if I had rolled a natural 10 or a six, uh, that's how you get an elite unit or a guards unit marker. So they kind of get like an instant promotion. If any modifiers to the final, okay. If any modifiers to the final spread apply, perform all shifts to the attacker first, then apply the defender. The effects of these new unit quality markers apply immediately. So you can instantly get a promotion or instantly become a poor unit and that takes place immediately. Um, when resolving combat, if there are quality markers of both types present, the owner chooses which one applies. All right. So that's what we got. There's a spread of one in favor of the U.S. player. Let's find out what that means. All right. I sort of paused there. I just committed a major blunder of letting my camera battery die. Okay. So 
we had a spread of one in favor of the US and you might be wondering, well, what does that mean? Okay, here's how you do casualties. Um, the every difference in the spread, the defender or like the attacker is gonna have to pay for that point by doing something. Okay, so let me find that section for you here so I can get that right, okay. The loser of the combat has to absorb the losses in different ways, or using any combination, he may apply them to any units that participated in the combat, i.e. the declaring defending unit and or the supporting units that added to the die roll if you had uh, friendly defending VC you know, next to the target. So we need to make up, there's a point spread difference of one, the VC need to pay for that by doing something bad to themselves, okay. You can retreat one hex or more to a maximum of three. Each hex retreated counts as one toward combat losses. So we have a one difference. Um, you can also eliminate a unit. That counts as one. I don't think they want to eliminate themselves, right? You can spend one body count point up to a maximum of two. Communist player spends body counts. Capitalist player spends casualties. Uh, you can spend one replacement, which we haven't really covered, but there's replacement points. As an alternative, the loser can eliminate all units and not pay for the remainder of the losses if he so chooses. And then there's a bunch of different weird things that happen to the body count casualty totals. All right, so we only need to, to satisfy one point. The VC unit's going to choose to retreat, and he's going to go back this way. Okay. Should you choose to retreat, each hex retreated must be further away from the combat hex. No unit may retreat more than three. You may pass through friendly occupied hex, but not through an enemy occupied hex or a zock. Should you retreat two hexes, you become disrupted. Put a disrupted marker on it. If you go three, you put a routed marker on it. Okay. For each retreating unit that became disrupted, you reduce your tank support level by one. This is how your support levels your overall support levels will drop. Okay, now, reduce artillery by two if any artillery support was used. This is where you have to be careful. Now, you'll notice in the combat, the US didn't use a lot of support because I saw that once I was gonna roll a D6, um, I may not win this combat. So I just used a little bit of artillery. Right, I didn't commit the other things because you could. I didn't want to take the chance if I lost them. I won, but just barely. Okay. Now, if there's a, if the unit is fresh and it retreats, you have to flip it. So remember, they rolled a d6 to keep this unit fresh. Well, that failed. They lost and they become spent anyway. Okay. So at least they're not wiped out. In addition, if a unit is disrupted or routed, draw from the cup of snafu. All right. We really haven't covered the cup of snafu, but some weird shit can happen. There's there's counters for everything. You can get a great leader, an incompetent leader. You can run out of ammo. You can run out of fuel. You can get ambushed. Your radio could go out. There could be an airstrike. Just a whole bunch of crazy stuff could happen. And that's one of the things I like about this system. There's a lot to remember, a lot of crazy modifiers and stuff to remember. But at its core, I think there's some cool things that can go down. Um, and I'm not good at, like breaking the rules and cheating and stuff and there's a board game geek post about something like that anyway okay advance after combat if the attacker won the combat and the defender has vacated the hex the attacker may move up with any units that participated in combat both declaring unit and any active only supporting units so i could go up in now the stacking rules in this game are weird you can only have one spent unit in a hex unlimited unspent these guys are spent so we're gonna we're gonna advance. Okay, we're gonna take that hex. Um, all units that advance in the combat hex may now spend the advance movement points value allowed by the combat chit to perform an exploitation movement. And I think the combat chit. Oh lordy, did I put that away? Uh oh, no, I didn't. Okay, whoo. Uh, advance three. Okay, so that will allow me to do a special exploitation move. I'm not really sure if I want to do that. I'll have to see. The defending player may never move after combat, even if he has won. Okay. 
So the U.S. will occupy that space. Now it does say May. Like I don't have to go in there. I could just kind of clear that out. But I want to I want to protect the lot and move up to here. Um, you can ignore stacking for a moment. This happens after combat losses have been satisfied. So I could have done this and then use my three points to do something else. So I guess we can kind of investigate how that works. Uh, so let's move both of them in. So for now, the stacking limits don't matter. And yeah, normal movement points apply. So let me do this, because I, I went into an enemy Zoc. I'm gonna put him back. All right, so he'll advance here. Then it says that anyone that advanced or supported can use that extra movement. And I'm going to go, uh, it's only three though. How much is it to move into a town? Movement cost for town is one half. So one half, oh man, this terrain is brutal. Uh, rough is two. I'm going to go here. I have three, do that shit, remember? So it cost me two to go here. I'm going to swing the second down this way. And we'll do that for the exploitation movement. Um, it's always voluntary and only active units that supported the attack. And the attacking unit that placed the chit may advance into a just vacated hex. Non-phasing units never move after combat, even if they won. Okay, so... Yeah, that's... Is that smart? Yeah, probably. I mean, that's... The lot is surrounded by mountains and you know to go in there for the capitalist player is four so i'm gonna swing this way the vc pay two for a mountain uh but i think that you know my zoc will help because it'll be three just to go in there so we'll have to see but we'll swing them down toward Fu, Fu, uh, puhoy puhoy uh to kind of cover that up okay that is that's <laughs> I'm telling you, I'm losing my voice. That is the most basic combat example in this game that I can give to you. Um, there's a lot involved. Uh, that's just like the tip of the iceberg. There's allocating air support. There's uh, um, bombardment points. Uh, you know, you can have a guy in a tunnel. Tunnels are plus four to the defense roll. There's no support allowed if you attack a tunnel hex. There's all sorts of stuff going on. Um, so I tried to make this the most basic possible uh, just so you could kind of see what all goes into the combat and if you'd even like it. So it all comes down to like spending your support. Support It's kind of like gambling. Do you want to spend support? Do you think you can get a good die roll uh, and win the combat? And if you don't, you're going to lose some, some support points. And there's a whole bunch of different phases. There's um, This is just part of a turn. You know, there's Chinese intervention check, there's uh, infrastructure and supply, there's strategic air, communist air, um, there's aircraft, airfield reinforcements, there's fleet redeployment, uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff going on in this game. So this is just the tip of the iceberg, and it took me that long to explain it. I'm trying to um, explain it the most basic way that I can. So uh, anyway, whew, that's a lot of work. All right. I think... I did that right. Let's see. Those that won their combat and advanced to the combat hex may spend as many exploitation movement points as the combat chit advance value. For all these movements, the basic rules are the same. Players move their units across the board and pay movement points. Okay. So I think after a unit that has ended its activation and may not move again until it is flipped to its fresh side during the opponent's activations segment. So when the capitalist player goes, all communist units flip to their fresh side, not the HQs. When the communist player goes, the VC comes up, um, the capitalist units will flip back over. Thusly. Okay. All right. So I hope I didn't bore you too much. And uh, that, that went on so long I ran out of battery. So I think I got it. If not, let me know if anyone's playing this game or has played the Korean OSS game. I don't know. I don't. I can't say that I hate it right now, but uh, whew, man, it's a lot of uh, chit chit record tracking and slight. You know, it reminds me of Next War, where you have to like constantly uh, 
move up and down, you know, these chits and you got to track all this stuff on here. And yeah, I'm not sure I'm down for that, but I, this is a, a very different Vietnam game. I, I kind of dig it, but, um, there's some cadre rules too. Um, cadres are kind of like HQs, but they let you do a few different things. Um, so I'm not sure if I screwed that up or not. Um, Cadres are logistic centers for the U.S. divisions and the focal point for VC recruitment. So to gain artillery, air bombardment, or tank support, a U.S. unit that is part of a division like these guys are, they need to track back to the like the first infantry cadre. But let's say it's been withdrawn. There is a rule that says all other units, including U.S. units that are not part of a division or their cadre has been withdrawn, can trace a normal line of supply to a friendly HQ. So that's what we did here, but I could have a 1st Infantry Division cadre unit here and they could go to that. Um, so yeah, that trace is four hexes. So just a heads up on that, and that's on page 20. So there's a lot to put in and you gotta decide like the mission that you wanna do each turn, you have to decide on the mission that you're gonna perform and that can like change everything that you're gonna do, especially if you're the US player, like if you're doing um, hearts and minds, um, you have to suffer all these penalties here. For each communist recruitment, roll a die. If you roll an even number, no recruitment occurs. So each one of these turns into like a coin game where you can influence what's happening um, on the board. So you might think, oh, well, this one sucks because you can't enter a Zoc. You can't get your VPs for body counts are halved because you're trying to win hearts and minds. And you're like, Oh, you have restricted support, but when the communist player tries to recruit, you can block that. And you can also reduce the unrest marker. So it's like coin meets, I don't know what kind of game. It's crazy. Uh, I'm intrigued by it though. So let me know what you think of the OSS system. I've got to get this video up. I got a slew of videos going up this week. And this is gonna be, uh, September is gonna be like Vietnam month. So just get ready for it, folks. I'm gonna be hitting them all. Um, all right, thanks for watching and uh, thanks for hanging in there. I know it was brutal.